Greetings, brothers and sisters. I hope you're benefiting from the devotional material that Pastor Ken and I are producing for you. Uh, we wish that we could have these conversations with you in person. Uh, we wish you could share this material more directly with you, but uh, God has put us in an interesting situation, and I put it that way very much on purpose. I want us to always be looking for and remembering uh, that God is up to some things here in the midst of our isolation and in the midst of our suffering, and that's the topic that I want to talk about for a few minutes uh, today is suffering. Uh, you might define that word in lots of different ways. Suffering is very broad. Suffering is something that can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be circumstantial, uh, it can be spiritual. And in a situation like we're in now with this pandemic, um, we're experiencing a, a mix of suffering. And for some of us, that might be new. Um, suffering uh, affects us in lots of different ways. It challenges our thinking, pushes us into temptation very often. Uh, the Bible uses lots of different words to describe suffering. Uh, as we've been looking at the book of James, we've talked a lot about trials. Uh, and trials uh, is certainly a good word for all of the forms of suffering that we might experience as believers in Jesus. Trials. Uh, that helps us remember some of the overarching purposes that God has for all of our suffering. And that's what I want to talk about today is the purpose in our suffering. I've reflected on this topic a lot in my life because I've experienced various kinds of suffering. And we're not going to trot out uh, what suffering looks like and measure it against each other's suffering. That's not particularly helpful. Uh, but I want to share with you today from a passage of Scripture that has been uh, really, really helpful for me personally over the years. I return to it over and over and over again, and it, it has helped me gain the perspective that I need to endure suffering. Uh, and also, it's helped me keep my eye out for what God may be doing in whatever form my suffering comes, no matter what the cause of my suffering is, whether it's bodily ailments, uh, whether it's uh, the threat of uh, government intrusion or the threat of bodily sickness like COVID-19 is presenting for all of us, or whether it's simply the suffering of loneliness and the feeling of missing friends and people who are dear to me. Those are all forms of suffering that this can take. Uh, that, that we can experience, or whether it's conflict, conflict in the home because you're stuck there and uh, you're not used to that, uh, and a different situation creates different tensions. All of the suffering that we experience, God has purpose in it. God is not taking his hands off of our suffering. Uh, he does not, he's not just letting things unfold in your life or in this world. He has his hand very much on the, on the wheel, as it were, uh, God is very much driving our suffering for particular purposes. And I want to talk about that from one particular passage of Scripture today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses uh, 16 through 18 in particular. Just three simple verses that really have a lot to say about the way that we handle our suffering and what God is up to in it. So no matter, no matter what suffering you've experienced, so this can be helpful as you process the things that have happened in your life in the past. Some of you have probably experienced uh, horrific suffering in your past. Some of you I know have experienced loss of loved ones. That is a kind of suffering. Some of you have experienced painful disease in your body. Some of you have experienced the disease of COVID-19 even in recent days. Some of you are still in the midst of the throes of that. I hope that, that you will find some encouragement from this passage, and I want to just reflect on it and make some comments about what Paul is saying here, because it really is a wonderful truth to hang on to in times like these, in times when things seem to be stripped away from us, whether that be our rights or our perceived rights, whether that be our economic stability, uh, whether our bank account is emptying faster than we'd like it to, or our retirement is not increasing the way that we would like it to. All of these things are forms of suffering. Our body is breaking down, 
And the scriptures are realistic about that. They don't sugarcoat that reality, the reality of our physical, bodily, uh, experiential suffering in this life. And I'm so grateful that they're so honest about the suffering that we will experience. But I'm more grateful that they tell us that there is a God who is doing good things in it all. So here's the passage, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal this passage is jam-packed, uh, and the, in the, if, if I could take a moment to put it in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul started this conversation in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 1, where he spoke about, he started speaking about the ministry that God had granted to him, the grace that was given to him as an apostle. Uh, and he, was, he started the, the chapter, this section, out by saying, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And then he goes into uh, discussing how he has conducted the ministry that God gave to him and the nature of that ministry as being uh, a a a preacher and a carrier of the gospel message, the treasure that he holds within his frail body, a jar of clay. Uh, And given the rejection that he's experienced, given the suffering that he's experienced, which he'll talk about later in 2 Corinthians with very specific terms in chapter 11 and chapter 12 especially, he says, we do not lose heart. And the question is, why, Paul? Why don't you lose heart given all the opposition that you face, given all the suffering that you've experienced? Why don't you lose heart? And what Paul gives us here is the secret. He comes back around to it after kind of a digression in some ways, focusing in on his ministry. But his real point in the chapter is to encourage the Corinthians so that they don't lose heart either in the midst of their sufferings. And so he comes back around to that finally in verse 16. So we do not lose heart. We are not losing heart, even though we suffer all these things. Why not? Because here's the truth. He says our outer self, and he's talking about our physical body and our experience out in the world. He's talking about our outer man, our outer person, the the way that our, our humanity connects with the outside world, with our physical surroundings. And so he's very much talking about the breakdown of our body, the weakness of our body, the vulnerability of our body. But not just our body, but the way that we engage with the world around us. So he's talking about our relationships. He's talking about our circumstances. He's talking about our situations. He's talking about the reality of living in this world. And he says the external, everything that's outside, is wasting away. It's in the process of decaying. It's fallen and broken, and it is breaking down. And every single one of us knows what that's like. Some some of you who might be watching this who are younger might be not thinking about it quite as often that your own body is actually breaking down because maybe you're in your prime and you're getting stronger. Well, I know for myself, I passed my prime several years ago, it seems, and my body is getting weaker and getting frailer and breaking down in various ways that I wish it wasn't. Now, I'm healthy uh, relatively, and uh, I am in in good sorts as far as physical condition goes uh, for a man my age. (laughs) I have to start saying that phrase now. Um, But nevertheless, I recognize that my body is decaying. If nothing else, my hair is getting whiter, and everybody can see it in my beard. Um, uh, I am getting older and my body is breaking down and yours is too and that's normal and that's happening and paul says that's what's going on and so this wasting away is a process that's going on and that's natural for all of us but it he uses a violent term here for wasting away it literally it's a term that's used in other places in the new testament to describe destruction it is a word that means to destroy something it can it's the word that's used 
when Jesus speaks about um, not caring about uh, worrying about clothing because it can be eaten by moths, that is, wasted away by moths. Uh, it's, uh, it appears in the book of Revelation to describe the destruction of ships. And so it's very much a word that means being destroyed. Our bodies, our outer man, our outer person is being destroyed. It's being destroyed because it's fallen, it's weak, it's frail, it's only made for this age. It is not fit. This vessel right here is not fit for the age to come. It is not fit for the new creation. It is only fit for this world, which is passing away itself. And so it too, this man, this physical, visible reality that you see, is wasting away. Now, if he stopped there, he wouldn't have told us anything that we didn't know. We know this from experience. We know this from observation in other people's lives. But he tells us this because he wants us to know that it's okay, that this is normal. This is the reality that we face. But then he wants to go deeper and say, but there's something else happening at the same time. Notice what he says. Uh, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, our inner man, is being renewed day by day. Notice the way he says this. He, he doesn't say it's going to be renewed. He doesn't say renew it yourself. He says it is being renewed day by day. This is a statement of reality. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're connected to the resurrected King, if you are in relationship with the living God, your, you, your inner self, is being renewed every day, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not. Even in your days, Christian, even in your days where you feel most depressed, where you feel least spiritual, even in days where your sin is raging and you are rejecting the resources that God provides for you, you're failing in your faith, even in those days, guess what? You are being renewed. God is at work in your life. If you are his child, he is in work. He is at work in your life every single day. In fact, I go even further and say, he is at work in your life every moment of every day. And there's nothing that your outer man can do that can mess that up, screw that up, or cause it to trip up and abort. God is at work in your life. That's really good news. He is renewing you. Notice that it says day by day. Why? Why is it necessary for daily renewal? Well, the implication is that you need renewal every day. That is, you leak. Uh, I remember John Piper giving an image when he preached on this passage once that talked about our life as a leaky bucket. Our bucket leaks every single day. And so it requires more filling up every single day. You see, we cannot depend on the grace that God promises for tomorrow Today, we need grace today. We need the mercy that God promises for today. We need the renewal today. And the reality is, God is giving it. The challenge for us is to tap into that, if you will, to experience it in our outer man, to to see it, to know it, to work in tandem with it, if you will, to live in light of the truth. The reality that God's Spirit is not just sitting on a lazy boy in your heart. He's not got his feet kicked up in your life. He is at work in you, brother and sister. He is at work in you. If you're a child of God, he is at work in you every single day. And you need it every single day. Another illustration from John Piper on this passage, he preached a sermon several years ago that that really helped me. Whatever you think about John Piper, I know some of you don't like him, and that's fine. But I can tell you that God used a, a, a sermon he preached on this passage in my life to, and I'm not exaggerating, but to save my life. Okay, So whatever you think of him, God used him in my life, and that's all I'm saying. But an illustration that he gave that I think is also fitting is the fact that you need to fill up your gas tank periodically, right? You can't, um, you can't fill up, you can't keep driving if your gas tank is empty. And the reality that this is painting is that the gas tank of our lives, we use it up every day. It, it gets empty every day. We leak, we experience leakage in our faith every day. 
That's the reality. None of us should be so proud or cocky in our spirituality that we say, well, my faith is really strong that I don't need anything today. I don't need extra grace from God. I'm not having a hard time today. You need to face the facts, brother and sister, that you do struggle. You do struggle in your faith. And people who say that they don't, that they don't have a hard time with their faith and they're not struggling with their faith, they are not very self-aware not really aware of what's going on in their own hearts. Because the Bible tells us the truth about our hearts. We need renewal every single day. And the beauty of this uh, promise is that God provides it every single day. Verse 17, he gives an explanation of what we're experiencing then. What's the big picture here? For this light momentary affliction. We could pause there and reflect on the beauty of that description. Our affliction, whatever suffering we're facing, is light and momentary. We, when we're in the middle of it, we tend to think it's all-encompassing. It dominates our attention. It, it, it is, it's, it's what's right before our eyes. We have trouble seeing anything else, in fact. We have trouble thinking of anything else because the suffering can be so hard. I mean, think about this in terms of physical pain. Sometimes... Pain is so acute, so intense, that it so dominates your thinking that you can't even hear when somebody is talking to you. You can't even focus long enough to listen and to pay attention to what someone is trying to tell you to do to help you. you you're, the pain is so intense that you can't pay attention to anything else. The reality of your pain is that it is light. Now, he's going to make this... In relative terms, he's going to—he's showing that he's comparing this against a big backdrop. But your suffering, whatever form it takes, is truly light in the grand scheme of things. And this is not to compare it to anybody else's suffering, but it is to compare it to what he's about to talk about. So we should think about our suffering in that regard. We should look at it and think about it and try to view it as light and also momentary. When we're in the midst of it, sometimes we think... We feel like, again, our feelings become dominant here. We feel like it's going to last forever. It's never going to end. There's never going to be any relief. But that's not true for the Christian. For you and for me as believers in Jesus, we are guaranteed that the suffering will end. There will be none of this in the new creation. No grief, no crying, no pain, no suffering in the new creation. Guaranteed for all of us. It will end. End. Tribulation, affliction, suffering has a certain end date, no matter what form it takes. But when, they're in, when we're in the midst of it, it is easy to feel like this is never going to end. This is never going to end. And Paul says it is momentary when compared, when thinking in light of eternity. This light, momentary affliction. But here's Paul's main point. It's in the verb in verse 17. This light, momentary affliction is doing something for you. It is preparing. Preparing. It's the same Greek word that James uses in James chapter 1 where he says that our trials are producing endurance or steadfastness. Producing. You see, the suffering that you experience in your lifetime bodily suffering, relational suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, circumstantial suffering, every single bit of it is doing something good for you. It's productive in your life and for your eternal life. Now, it's hard to see it that way. It really is. It's difficult for any of us to get this perspective, but that's why this text is here. That's why I've worked so hard to drill it into my mind and into my heart so that it shapes the way that I face suffering. And I don't do this all the, way, all the time very well, especially when my body is broken. I'm a very poor, sick person. My wife can tell you. I'm not a good patient. I don't deal well when my body is weak and broken. And I'm trying to get better at that when it happens by reflecting on this text. And I hope it's helpful for you as well. But the reality of whatever your suffering is, whatever your suffering is, if you're a believer in Jesus, you can know for certain that it is doing something productive for you. Every moment, every detail of the suffering that you've experienced in your life is producing for you an eternal weight of glory 
beyond all comparison. Note the contrast. Paul is very careful here in his contrast. He said our affliction is momentary, but the glory we are to experience is weighty. It's heavy. The affliction that we, it's eternal, momentary and eternal versus eternal. The affliction we experience in this life, even if we are afflicted for a hundred years, we experience suffering for a hundred years, that is a blip on the timeline when we consider the length of eternity. It is a momentary affliction. The glory we will experience is eternal. Our affliction is light. No matter how heavy it feels in the moment of experience, it is truly light when compared with the weight of glory, the heaviness of glory that uh, we will experience and we will receive. It is beyond all comparison. Now what you've got to see is that whatever you've experienced in your life, whatever suffering, whatever hardship, whatever deprivation you've experienced, it is for this purpose above all others. It is for this purpose above all others. God is taking what bad things have happened in your life. He's taking those specific, precise things that happened to you as an individual. Not that happened to somebody else, but happened to you. He's taking those events, those experiencing experiences, and he's weaving them and molding them and transforming them so that in the new creation you will experience a certain measure, a certain weight of glory that I will not experience. Why do some people suffer more than others as Christians? I'm convinced this is the reason. You who have suffered, have suffered more than I have for more years and in deeper ways will experience in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, in your new body, you will experience a greater measure of glory than I will because of the suffering that you've experienced in your lifetime. Those of us who have suffered very little, we will experience glory and it will be weighty and wonderful and joyful and amazing and beyond our ability to describe. But it will be less it seems, than the glory experienced by others who have suffered more. God knows what He's doing, and here's the thing. God has the right, God has the right and the wisdom to divvy out suffering as He sees fit to bring about the greatest magnitude of glory because all the glory that we will experience in the new creation ultimately is pointed to Him, right? All this glory is a share in His glory, a share in His value, an experience of His identity. And so suffering takes us deeper even now during our lives, gives us an opportunity to know Jesus better and to experience faith in Him in a deeper and, 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 and unique way that someone else cannot share. The story that God is writing in your life with the unique suffering that is featured chapter after chapter is a part of this wondrous glory that God is preparing for you in the new creation. That should give you great hope even in the midst of suffering. You can know for certain if you're a child of His, that whatever pain you're experiencing, whatever loss you've experienced, whatever conflict you're going through, whatever pain, whatever suffering, whatever oppression you may experience in this life, God is using it specifically and precisely to create something new for you. He's taking the material of your suffering and He's transforming it into a beautiful, beautiful work of art that you will get to enjoy forever and ever and ever and ever. It is the weight of glory that is being promised to you, and it is beyond all comparison, and it is worth everything that you might experience in this life. So how do we believe this? How do we experience this even now at one level? Verse 18, as, as we look, we look, not to the things that are seen. Okay, so he says, as we look not at what is visible. 
Well, what's that mean? That's the affliction. That's what you can see. You can see the pain. You can see the suffering. He says, don't look at that. So how do you experience even now in your life, even now in the midst of your suffering, how do you experience, how do you not lose heart? How do you experience faith and joy and hope in this eternal weight of glory even now in the midst of the suffering? How do you do that? Well, you've got to look a certain way. You've got to look at not what's visible, that's the affliction, but to the things that are unseen. So Paul says, look at what is invisible. Look at what's invisible. How do you do that? Well, he's talking about faith. He's talking about trusting this very word. The things that are unseen is the glory that's been promised. The glory that your suffering is even now producing for you in the future. So you've got to look with eyes of faith. You've got to believe these words are true. And so you look at what is invisible. You look to the glory that's promised to you. You believe the promises of God for you. The things that are seen, the affliction, are transient, temporary. He already called them momentary. Now he calls them transient. They're fleeting. They're temporary. They're going to go away before you know it. But the things that are unseen, this glory that's promised to you is eternal. It will never fade. It will never wear out. It will never deplenish. Deplete. Is deplenish a word? I don't think so. <laughs> it will never deplete. It will never reduce. It will never decrease. It will be ever increasing even. Glory, the experience of relationship with God, the experience of joy in God is something you can experience now as a Christian in your relationship with God even now. How do you do that? By faith. You trust the promises of God. That's ultimately how you survive in the midst of suffering. Now, I know, I know from my own experience of suffering of a variety of kinds that this is a hard word. It really is. When you're in the midst of it, it is very difficult to do. And I don't think Paul was na naive to that. It requires the renewal that's spoken of here. It requires the, the grace that is uh, promised from God. It, it requires for our perspective to be such in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering, that we look beyond our pain or even through it somehow to see the glory that's been promised for us, the promises of God to fix our eyes on Jesus and to fix our eyes on the fulfillment of all of the promises that have come to us in Jesus is hard. It requires God's grace. We can't do it in our own. That's what this renewal is all about. Now, the renewal is something that we that we uh, participate in in a certain way. And again, it's all about faith in Jesus, experiencing the renewal of the mind, as Paul said in Romans 12, the renewal of the mind. And how does that happen? It happens by receiving the Word of God, by looking into it and responding with faith and obedience. That's what we're talking about here in our day-to-day -day experience. We desperately need to cling to the truths of God's Word. We desperately need to look with faith and hope to the promises of God for the future. We have to have a future-oriented faith. If you look at Hebrews 11 and you read about the stories of all of those heroes of the faith, the hall of faith there, every single, every single story that's told there, by faith, so-and-so did something. And the faith, if you read carefully in those stories, or you go back to the Old Testament and you read the story of those characters, what did they believe? What was their faith all about? It was all about the promises of God. And the author of the Hebrews makes that clear in a couple of cases. With Abraham, for example, by faith, Abraham uh, left his homeland, left his family. Why? Because he was looking forward to a better country. Not the land that he was initially sent into, but a better country, a heavenly country, a city even. He was looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises of God. And I would, I would argue that everybody in Hebrews 11, all of those Old Testament characters had specific promises about the future that they could cling to. A future that would be fulfilled not even during their lifetime, for the most part. So our faith has to have this future orientation, particularly during our suffering. 
So friends, as you experience whatever form, whatever shape suffering takes in these days, as the coronavirus continues to spread, it does seem like it's improving. It does seem like there is hope for a return to normalcy soon, whatever soon means. But let that not be your real hope. Don't put your hope simply that we can go back to work as normal, that we can return to gathering together in some sem semblance of normality. Don't let that be your ultimate hope. Put your hope in something bigger, something more wonderful, and something more certain. Put your hope in the promise of day-by-day -day renewal, and put your hope in the promise, ultimately, of the glory of God that you will get to experience in a new body, in a new creation. Fix your reflections, your meditations, on that. Would you pray with me? Father, as we continue to experience various kinds of trials in the midst of this larger trial with the coronavirus and all that's come underneath that umbrella, the loss of income, the loss of jobs, the loss of security of retirement for some folks, uh, the loss of relationships as we're isolated from one another, and the loss of health for many of us. Father, would you grant us the grace to see the renewal that's going on in our hearts, in our inner person. Help us to tap into that. Help us to cultivate that in whatever ways we can by looking into the scriptures, trusting Jesus for what he's provided for us, and putting our hope ultimately on the glory that is to be revealed to us on the last day, resurrection day. May we put our hope firmly in the promise of this glory, this eternal weight of glory for each one of us. Thank you that you are promising here to turn all of our sorrow, all of our pain for ultimate eternal good. Thank you that you can do that and that we can count on you for that. Would you help us to rest in that reality and not to squirm so much and to fight and to, to be in such turmoil in these days when we've lost so much. Father, help us to trust you for what you're doing, for the good that you're doing in the midst of it all. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who initiated our faith, gave it to us in the first place as a gift, and he is the one who will bring it to its final culmination on the last day to ensure that we cross the finish, finish line victorious. Let us put our hope there. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.